everybody. My name is Patrick Botts Forbes. I am the LAFD Community Emergency Response Team Central Bureau Coordinator. And this training is going to teach you one way that you can deploy out uh, during a disaster or deploy has its um, interesting connotations. Uh, this is going to be one way that you as a CERT member in a neighborhood team can self organize with your team, set up a staging area and then do an initial response to that disaster. I was mentioning earlier, in my opinion, this is the core of what CERT is. We are the first responders in our own neighborhoods during a disaster until the professionals arrive. And we know in Los Angeles we have earthquakes. The theory is that a moderate sized earthquake, something bigger than Northridge hitting the LA basin will immediately render the fire department overwhelmed. 911 will be overwhelmed. Police department will be overwhelmed. And we saw this at Ridgecrest. Ridgecrest was kind of a remote area away from Los Angeles, but immediately after that earthquake hit on the 4th of July, their 911 system was inundated. Their fire department was completely deployed. And so that is what we expect to happen in really kind of any disaster. Immediately after that disaster, you will not get that first responder response that you expect. So that's where the community emergency response team comes into play. And that training teaches you how to do so safely because we don't want to bring a victim to a disaster or bring a victim to an incident. Uh, Chief Zipperman, um, do you have anything you'd like to say? Yeah, good. Uh, I don't know if you're able to see me on camera. Uh, if you are great, let me know if you can see me and hear me just to verify that. I can hear you. OK, your square okay. is. I don't know why Lacking. it should be on. Camera's on. My camera's on, so I'm not sure why I'm not coming up. But uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Dean Zipperman. I'm actually um, assistant chief assigned to the uh, Operations West Bureau, which is uh, you're talking about Battalion 5. Uh, that'll be right underneath my uh, my land tomorrow. Or I'm sorry, on uh, Monday. Um, actually, uh, I want to... First off, thank Patrick for putting this together. Uh, I'm not normally assigned here in the Central Bureau. However, um, with my time and experience with the LAFD of uh, almost 35 years, I've had a great opportunity to work in the downtown area. So very familiar with the CERT team does, uh, uh, the process that you employ and also what you bring to the table. And I just want to thank each and every one of you. I know it's a, uh, you volunteer your time, uh, you, you volunteer, uh, time away from your loved ones as well as uh, um, critical times when there's a disaster and I know that uh, you provide a lot of support to us in need um, and I just want to say it's it's I know Patrick was talking about natural disasters I certainly was part here during the uh, earthquake Northridge earthquake so I was able to experience that as well um, but I also want to let you know that the CERT teams will also be activated during other things like let's say civil unrest um, if there's if there's if it's a, a you know you have protection and so forth and what I mean by that is there's going to be some areas of the city that if our resources are strapped and we're running low on resources we may have the cert teams um, come together in certain areas to provide assistance uh, just to base on the fact that we have an impact on our resources from fire stations to be able to respond uh, they may be resources drawn out to other parts of the city same thing that would happen during a large wildfire with either within the city or we're in a red flag day red flag alert day um, we have high winds santa ana winds we'll, we'll use cert teams to help us with uh, wires down and the security of intersections and so forth in residential neighborhoods so there's a lot that the cert team does they certainly interact with not only their communities but they interact with uh, um, commercial and um, um businesses as well and i just want to thank each and every one of you as uh, you are a critical component to the los angeles fire department so thank you thank you chief everybody uh, does anybody have any questions for chief uh, zipperman all right then let's get started i'm going to go ahead and share my screen
So uh, these are pictures from some of our exercises that we've run in Battalion 2 and uh, in other parts of the city. Uh, we do occasionally do night drills uh, just so you get the experience of what might actually happen during a drill because the sun's not always up. All right, so the first question is why does CERT need to self-organize during a disaster? And as I mentioned earlier, uh, fire department's not always going to be available, especially when there's a disaster. Um, they will eventually uh, come. They're still going to take as much information as they can, and they will still eventually show up, but it might not be as quickly as you need it to be or hope it will be. And in LA City especially, we're used to uh, fire department and EMS being available within five to seven minutes of us placing that call to 911. Uh, during a disaster, that response time is going to be much, much, much longer. So as volunteer first responders in our own communities, we have the basic training uh, on fire suppression, on looking at a building, telling if it's safe to enter, and of course, how to do basic first aid. So we can help our neighbors out at the very minimum and that really means what I expect to happen is there's going to be a lot of people who come out of their homes right after an earthquake barefoot. They're going to step on broken glass. And that minor injury left untreated will actually get infected and actually become a medical emergency. So if we can do the bare minimum of just being able to clean and bandage a, a slight injury, we're going to be able to save lives. What you do in the first few hours after a disaster is going to be meaningful. It will save lives and um, these are your neighbors that you're going to be looking after. One thing is that um, this training originated in Los Angeles City. It was created by the fire department, LAFD, and it's now national. It's now international. Uh, one of the things that they say during the training is you do not self-deploy ever. What that means is if you see on the TV that there is a fire going on in Santa Monica and you don't live in Santa Monica, don't go to Santa Monica when no one's called you. That's what self-deploying is. But in the case of a disaster, we're going to self-organize because if you're waiting for the fire department or the emergency management department to call you right after an earthquake, you're not going to get that call. I hope that makes sense to everybody. You're literally looking out your window and you see somebody in need, go help that person. And it might be that you're going to call for help, but at the very least, you want to help your neighbors out. So the second question becomes, where is my closest cert staging area? In LA City, that's a major question that I have. And it's something that I'm working on in Battalion 2 and Central Bureau. Um, quite frankly, I don't think these have ever been defined. Um, in other parts of the country, maybe they have a specified cert staging area. Um, in my opinion, it needs to be uh, local. It needs to be a neighborhood level uh, location. If you have to drive to your cert staging area, it's too far away. Uh, the reason it exists is that's where you're going to go and meet with other cert members. That's where you're going to go and meet with your neighbors who are trained and so that you can now form a team and actually do some good. If you're waiting at home and your immediate neighbors to your left and right are not cert trained, then you're not a team. Now, maybe you have a family who everyone in the family is cert trained. That's the great star of a team. I can only hope and wish that everyone gets cert trained and their entire family is, but the reality is that we're fear fairly few and far between, even in our own neighborhoods. Um, what we're looking for for CERT staging areas are places kind of out of the way. What we see happen is if there's a tent that says volunteer sign up or emergency responders or fire department or whatever, people in need will naturally gravitate to that. And if you're there trying to organize a response, those people are going to become a hindrance. So generally speaking, I like my search staging areas to be out of the way of public view. The back of a building or parking lot is ideal, uh, something with access that people can go to, 
but not something on Main and First Street right on the corner. Uh, it should also be centralish to the neighborhood because that's the area that you're going to be serving. That's the area you're going to be doing a damage assessment, and that's the area you're going to be trying to help. And so if you're on the corner of a neighborhood, it's going to take longer to get to the other corner of the neighborhood than if you were actually in the center of the neighborhood and you're searching out in the radius. Um, one thing we want to do with these search staging areas is have an agreement with the property owner. We don't want to say, OK, we're going to set this up at a school and the school knows nothing about this um, because then we're trespassing at that point. So that's what we're looking to do is find these locations and set up agreements so that we can be a help to that property owner and they want us there. Ideally, what I'd like to have is a staging area kit at each of these locations. And this kit's going to be fairly basic. We just need the supplies there for you to start that initial response. Maps of the neighborhood that you're serving, forms, all the cert forms and everything, clipboards, pens, pencils, everything you need to hand out to people who are there so that if they did not bring their own stuff, you can provide it so they can get to work. Two-way radios are a must. That's going to probably be the most expensive thing in the staging area kit, but we need to be able to communicate. If you have two radios and 15 people, your effective range of those teams is going to be extremely limited. And then medical resupply. What, what I'm talking about are like bandages and dressings, the dry stuff, stuff that we're going to burn through simply by helping people out. People are going to get injured. People are going to get hurt. People are going to get cut up. They're going to get scraped and scratched. If we can put a barrier between those openings in the skin, and the outside world, we're going to do a lot of good for them. Now, what I hear every time we talk about this is people naturally want to gravitate towards going to a fire station or a school. And it makes a lot of sense from the outside. If you think, OK, the schools are generally in the neighborhood, the fire stations, that's where the fire department's going to be. But the reality is the fire department's not going to be there. Those fire stations are going to be locked down. And if you go there thinking that you're going to be talking to the fire department, you're not. Schools, schools go into lockdown during a disaster. If there's an earthquake, they lock down until the parents show up and pick up their kids. No one in or out of campus. So that's going to be a massive problem if that's the core of your plan is to go to the local elementary school. They're not going to let you in. So we need to find other locations that are better suited to be search staging areas. When you get there, the first question is always going to be who's in charge? Well, during an incident, the first person who shows up is the first person in charge until they're relieved by a more appropriate person or party. And that means if you're you show you come across a car accident and someone's injured and there's no one else there, you're the person in charge. Fire department shows up, they're going to relieve you of that and now you're either going to assist them or they're just going to say thank you and you can go on your way. Uh, same thing when you show up at the staging area. If you're the first person there, you're in charge of the staging area and that can be daunting. That can make people who. Sorry, my work phone is going off. OK, apologize for that. Um, that can be daunting because people don't know what to do. They don't want to be in charge. And that's the purpose of this training is to tell you a step by step plan on what to do if you're the first person there, how to build out the staging area, how to deploy out teams. Now, it could be that. You don't want to be the cert the person in charge, but you are the most appropriate person. A lot of times we see leaders who don't want to be leaders and they are actually much more suitable to be a leader than the person who shows up and says, OK, I don't care. I'm the person in charge now because I've been doing this the longest. Those people are problematic. So who's in charge really depends on who is the most appropriate person to be in charge. An incident commander or operations chief is typically the person who is going to be in charge of this incident or the response to this incident. 
uh, the staging manager is the person who's in charge of a staging area and their duty to find an ICS and sync command system is to put together teams for the operations chief or the incident commander. Uh, and a person can have multiple roles. If you're the first person there, you're the incident commander, the operations chief, and the staging manager until you can hand those roles off to other people. Now, the new FEMA training from for CERT says, and I agree with this, CERT is almost never going to be the incident commander. There's always going to be a more appropriate person in a larger response. So fire department shows up, they're the incident commander. If you're part of a neighborhood that's part of a community, that's part of a battalion that has a fire department that's responding and in charge, they are the incident commander of that entire area. So I would rather almost never say, use the word incident commander in relation to CERT. Um, early on, our or previous our training is that CERT incident commanders will exist and they'll hand off control to the fire department. I would actually want to say, let's not even do that. Let's not go to that point. But the question now becomes, well, if we're at a CERT staging area and the staging manager is not really in charge of doing anything but deploying out or organizing teams for the incident commander to respond with, it becomes a little gray. And I've asked for clarification from different people and no one has given me any. So for the purpose of this training and what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna say that the CERT staging area manager is the person in charge of that CERT staging area and takes on the operations role deploying out teams into the area until they've been relieved by someone of a higher command. But we're not going to call them the incident commander. Hope that's clear. I know it's fuzzy and it's gray and it, it it's not well defined, but that's the best I can do at this point. The end goal should really be that the search staging areas are going to tie in together at some point and reach up to the fire department. What these CERT staging areas need to do is identify the incidents within their area that they're responding to, treat, triage, and stabilize as best they can, and let the fire department know what they can't handle and what needs the professionals to respond to. So we built out a 10-step guide for this. Um, and the the guide is up online and it's linked in the chat and it will be up on our Facebook pages as well when we post this video. But this is what we're going to be going through step by step through this guide. During a disaster or at the very beginning of a disaster, number one, first and foremost, take care of yourself and your loved ones. If you have a family member who is injured or a home that's been destroyed or, or severely damaged, take care of that. If you come out to a CERT staging area and are expected to deploy out to help out your neighbors and you're worried about your family members who have been injured, you're not going to be effective. Stay home, take care of your family and home first. If everything is good, then go ahead, help out your neighbors. Number two, Monitor your local neighborhood or radio channel or neighborhood or battalion radio channel. In the case of battalion two and the case of a lot of cert, we're using FRS radios. Those are family radio service radios. Those are cheap and easy to get, relatively speaking. You go to any store, um, any electronic store, Costco, uh, Home Depot, Amazon, and you can buy what are called bubble packs. There's two radios to a pack and they allow you to communicate decently. Find out what your neighborhood is doing, what channel they're gonna be on. Then once you get an assessment of your family, make sure everyone's safe, turn the radio on, start listening. When you get a chance, go ahead and check in. And that's gonna sound something as simple as whatever your call sign is um, for the sake of LAFD. Um, for what we're doing, my call sign is Cabrillo One. So I'll check in on the radio, Cabrillo One monitoring, just to let people know that there's somebody there. And then if other people pop on and they're monitoring, I'll give a status update and say, 
This is Gabriel one. Uh, my home is fine. No family members injured. Uh, any other anyone else with updates? And sometimes you just need to prod a little bit to get people to actually who are listening to the radio, give them an indication that they should report in as well. Third thing, wear long pants, closed toed shoes and PPE. This should be fairly obvious. Uh, during our drills or in our exercises, we mandate long pants, closed toed shoes. We have people unfortunately regularly show up at drills in shorts and sandals. Those people have to go home because it's not safe for them to be there. That's the official thing. What I'll typically do is I'll put these people to work at the in at the staging area where it's going to be relatively safe for them because I don't want to turn people away. But we've had drills where it was not safe to be out there at the back of a fire station that is rocky and has rattlesnakes and spiders in sandals. And that's unfortunate. Um, so absolutely positively make sure you have long pants and closed toed shoes. Boots are great, not necessarily required. Uh, safety toed boots are even better, but again, not necessarily required. Step four, report to your closest search staging area. This is the, the core of that response. If you're alone at home, you're not doing anybody any good. But if you go meet up with other CERT members, now you can form a team and start doing something. And of course, if you're the first one at the staging area, congratulations, you are now the staging manager. Step six, next two to three people who arrive at the CERT staging area are the first damage assessment team. What the most critical thing that we have to, to factor in is that we don't know how bad it is and the staging area is blind. It's in a place, can't see the incidents as they show up. We need teams to go out there and actually find out how bad it is and report it in. Fire department's doing the exact same thing. Right after an earthquake, they're gonna perform what's called a windshield assessment. They're gonna drive their first in area. They're gonna see how bad it is. They will literally drive by a burning building because they don't know what's worse beyond it. Then once they get a complete picture, now they can organize their response and figure out, prioritize their instance, figure out what they're going to go work on first. CERT does the same thing. Um, after you have one or two damage assessment teams out there, as additional people arrive and you organize them into teams, you're going to determine if there you need more damage assessment teams out there or if you have enough instance that you need to start responding. And you're going to base everything on the instance that are coming in, being radioed in, on what you need to do next. As the response grows, and we get this wrong a lot, hold back responders and build out your staging areas admin side. If you have five teams out there and you're the only one at the staging area, you are going to be overwhelmed. You're going to be completely inundated and you're not going to be able to manage those teams at all. Response teams should have different levels of communication. Um, this means often different radio channels or different radios entirely. Uh, what we want to see is teams with intra, inter or intra team tactical radio communications. So you can, if you're a team leader, you can talk to your team members. If you have a, a response team out there, you'll have enough people that it makes a lot of sense that you're communicating with them, especially if they break off and they deal with a couple people deal with one instant while you're dealing with another and being able to communicate with them is going to ensure team safety and that you know what's going on. And then your strategic communications are radioing back from a team to the staging area, letting the staging area, keeping them up to date where you are and what's going on. And then at the very end, step 10, we want these staging areas to be communicating with other CERT staging areas and in the end up to the fire department so we can let them know what incidents we have that they need to respond to and hopefully they'll be able to.